There's always that 20 second lag time. Okay, great. All right, so I'll <laughs> restart that for a second. Again, sorry, everybody. Um, but again, thank you for joining us for the Monsoon Seminar Series. This will be our last uh, seminar until kind of our mid-year break. For So for some of us, that's summer break. For some of us, that is winter break. Um, but we shall see all of you again in August. Um, but um, And so just check our, our, our website and uh, join our email list uh, if you're interested in more updates. And so without further ado, um, it's time to introduce our speaker for today. And so we're joined now by Dr. Raj K. Singh from the Indian Institute of Technology and Bhuba Naswar. And so again, without further ado, let's learn a little bit about the Asian monsoon system in the late Miocene. So take it away. Thank you, Tara, and thank you, Peter, for inviting. So. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all in respective countries. So today I am going to talk about a little bit about the Asian monsoon systems, uh, starting since the late Miocene, and then I will move to the uh, like uh, the uh, monsoon variability in the Meghalayan period in the this part of the world where I am. So it is a long period I would like to cover. So let me start. And so many of the speaker, I think uh, prior to me, Dr. Professor Hema Achyuta Mem, she has explained details about the monsoon spectral influencing the monsoon and all these things. Uh, basically it is a seasonal change in the wind that we understand. And that for the most majority of the people that monsoon means the Southwest monsoon or the summer monsoon. Yeah, and for India, it is the, like more we are depending our economy, our activities are depending on that southwest monsoon. A uh, little bit uh, that uh, Hemabhadam also talked about northwest monsoon and the parts of the Tamil Nadu which is in, uh, it is like affect that region. So she talked in details about that thing. Uh, the other part, which is just a little bit north of us, that East Asian summer monsoon, which is also like one of the important monsoon phenomena which was influencing the part of the China. And there is also there the East Asian winter monsoon which is influencing the Japanese coast and all these things. So I'll talk about it a bit about the ISM evolutions then the when our data suggests that Northwest monsoon or seasonality has been begin. And then I will talk a little bit about that uh, last 400 kilo record of the East Asian summer monsoon and that 1.2 million record of the East Asian winter monsoons. So when we are going for the paleo monsoon studies, like we are dependent on the different proxies. And one of the important is like we have to decipher between the monsoonal wind proxy, precipitation proxy and runoff proxy. I believe that it is not necessary that when the monsoonal wind proxy is strong, the precipitation will be strong everywhere or it will be equal everywhere. There are the, some regional or some local factors are there which are influencing. So if you see this monsoonal upwelling proxy, this is the one of the most uh, important regions where this is people have started studying is the Oman margin where the ODP had drilled the number of cores 722, 723. And basically when this monsoonal winds are strong, it drags the surface water from that Oman margin, which is quite hot. And to replace that water, the bottom water, which is cool and nutrient rich is coming. And when these waters are coming to the surface, it's bringing the nutrients and also this cools the surface water over these regions and which make this uh, uh, sub-Antarctic or sub-Arctic species to be present here. And the initial studies, I'll show you also that we could have on the basis of the population count, they have talked about the evolution of and the intensification of monsoon. So higher the monsoonal wind strength, more the upwelling and more these little uh, creatures that global gerina buloides will be there. Now when the nutrient and productivity will be high, 
then if definitely that more of this will be go down so settling down in the processes it will consume lots of oxygens as well as these productivities are also getting inferred by this benthic foraminifera species called the ibigerina basically more focusing on the ibigerina proboscidea or ibigerina peregrina so more the productivity the formation of omg takes place and the subaxic species uh, having uh, that indicating the higher productivity, they will more in the number. So Ibigerina is one of the indicators. It may also be the runoff indicators when we are talking about the nutrient or the productivities come up due to the runoff things. Uh, second proxies is the precipitation proxies, basically, and the uh, speleothems and the cave records are one of the best to understand that uh, local precipitation in the region. So. Uh, this, whenever that rainfall occurs, like it has having the certain isotopic signatures, and these isotopic signatures are we get in the cave formation in the stalagmite as well as the stalactite. But however, for the dating and that uniform growth, we prefer the stalagmite. Uh, it is important that it should not be not connected directly with the atmosphere so that it can retain the signature of the precipitations. So we have the higher the precipitations, we get that more lighter isotopes, oxygen isotope enrichment in the stalagmite. So I'll show you some of the stalagmite signatures also. And these are the certain caves, like which is one of the uh, picture of the Mablu cave where we have collected the number of samples and we can found that it is having the stalagmite tight, stalagmite, and lots of deer. And thanks to the new dating method, we can very precisely date these stalagmites and can get the edges. A third proxy is the runoff, runoff proxy, actually. And runoff proxy, actually, is if it is established, it is OK. And it is not established like most of the lake studies or that along the coastal regions and all these things. We have to think of that which or what component will work depend on the runoff, local runoff. So we can have to depend on that certain elemental ratio. This is the one of the data I'm showing that where we have done this monitoring in the southwest, northeast, and pre-southwest monsoon season so that we can use this data to understand that which can be a or which can indicate the higher rainfall or higher runoff to the region. Different clay minerals also depend on the uh, regions we can do. So different lakes people are using and they have either using the established proxy or they are doing the seasonal monitoring or their over the year monitoring and they establish that what should be the ideal proxies to get the rainfall signature from the record. So basically, these are the three different proxies we are using uh, to understand the monsoonal system. And if you see, this is the monsoonal wind pattern. Uh, it is like uh, coming from the Arabian Sea. It is crossing the southern part of the India and then going to the Bay of Bengal. And it's because of this uh, Tibetan law, it is moving to that region. So uh, as like previous, uh, I said that came a, Professor Hemachita, when we have talked detail about Northeast monsoon, which is formed due to the uh, high pressure developed in the Siberian and the Tibet Plateau region. So, if I'm going to the Miocene monsoon, that earlier record has come, as I just already told, that ODP site 722 and 723, when the crew natal have been actually monitored this abundance of this Bulodis species, which is really not supposed to be here because. Uh, this Oman margin is at the 15 degree north, which is like warm subtropical climate. And this species prefers the temperature between 5 to 10 degrees centigrade or the cooler temperature, cool water species. So they are more and they're indicating the more of the upwelling. And the basis of that was earlier, as like many people have talked about, like either monsoon has been or that's upwelling. Actually, I said then it started around 12 million years, intensified at eight million years, and there were the frequent changes it's been observed. 
Uh, and this is the species which occur there. So we have studied the number of sites in the Indian Oceans, and we try to understand this productivity changes with the Evigerina proboscidea. Uh, that Gupta and Srinivasan also have been studied that prior to us, and they have in the 1992, they have suggested that major intensifications around seven to eight million on the basis of abundance of the yeah, Evigerina proboscidea, as I suggested, it can be that one of the higher productivity species and the, generally it is rated that the higher, the stronger the monsoon, the productivity in this part will be higher and this species will be more in number. Uh, we have done the number of analysis in the different sites along this and we found that all the sites have been suggesting the changes in the uh, productivity around 10 to 8 million years uh, ago. And we have uh, published this work and we thought it is the intensification or initiation of the monsoon that was took place around 10 to 8 million years ago. It's not only that other productivity indicator like CO3, proboscidea abundance, and the stable isotope record also is suggesting there are the changes during that time period. And it may be the intensification of the monsoon. Uh, later on, the Gupta et al. has been studied the other sites from these uh, regions. And they have uh, talked about that the like initiation of monsoon based on the different record is the onset of the monsoon around 12.9 MA and intensification around 7 and that strengthening of the Northern Hemisphere glaciation around 2.5. Uh, if you talk about this monsoon, then this upwelling, and we are connecting the most of the recent study even that we also did, and it is very well connected to the, uh, this uh, North Antarctic deep water and AMOC. But when we're talking about the monsoon in the Miocene, the two question still like, I am not very much sure of that this MOC or the, the formation of the thermoline circulations was not that strong uh, during the Miocene period. Uh, if you see this, there, the, there, it was that uh, both the American continent was far apart and the current directions was different it was not strong. So this upwelling water, it may not be that what we are connecting today with the uh, Northern Hemisphere, a number of papers, the very good journals have been published which connect always with the Northern Hemisphere. But I am like, if you look the Moams in monsoon, we think that because this the thermo halan or MO was not that strong that time, so it may not be dead water, but Buloides is there, upwelling it is suggesting, cold water suggesting. So it may be that southern source or southern hemisphere, Arctic, Antarctic water or air intermediate water may have coming here and influencing or the coming the upwelling. Second, also the important part here that uh, this, uh, uh, this Northeast monsoon at the previously that the Professor Hema talked about, it is formed because of the high pressure cell that is over the Siberian and the Tibet Plateau. But so this was the Northern Hemisphere glaciations was not there during that time period or not that much during that time period. So we are not sure of that this much as uh, like regular or seasonal change in the uh, wind pattern was there or not. Uh, none of the records are the suggesting. So it may have like after this, closing of the Isthmus of Panama, and then it's become the stronger, and then it has the formation of the you know, glaciations. We have the seasonality in the monsoon, or actual that monsoon term, where we're talking about the seasonal reverse of the winds we are getting. And our benthic records uh, from the Gupta and Thomas are indicating it is the year after initiation of the North, or the formation of the Northern Hemisphere glaciation, see to 2.5 million years. And our record also recently we have published, it is also suggesting that after the formation of the Northern Hemisphere glaciation only, the major changes in the benthic biophysis we are getting. 
which indicating that seasonality or that whatever the modern monsoon type like Northeast and the Southwest monsoon was started around 3 million years ago and so. So this is the still having that questions or that it, we don't have that what how these uh, are there because among like many of the studies have also suggested it started around the Oligocene and all these things. If it's there, it's okay. Otherwise, uh, and that uh, it may be that southern source of water having the influence in the monsoon systems during the Miocene. Uh, when we are talking about uh, after this, uh, there are lots of uh, Miocene after the Pleistocene. We don't have the very what called that the high resolution record except for the Clemens that are recently published. And they have suggested that uh, uh, orbital scalability has influenced all these things. Rest are the very low resolution record, but we have to record for the, after the MPT and the late Pleistocene time period. So next part, I'm talking something about that uh, from this Indian summer monsoon or the to the part of there where we have studied the East Asian summer monsoon and the East Asian winter monsoon. So I was one of the participants of the IODP expedition 346, which theme was the Asian monsoon. And we have analyzed the samples from this U1423, 1426, and 1429. This 426 and 423, we have the 1.2 million year records, uh, which are indicating the major paleoceanographic changes, but also like 423 records are having uh, like more of the signals that what we believe is the indicating the East Asian winter monsoon conditions. So if you talk about these changes, we found that around the 1.7 million years, so 17 and a half kilo years, that onset of Tsushima current has been uh, took place in the Japan Sea and which had actually like governed the productivity changes there. But major changes, or you will see this and uh, we find a lot of stakes disruptive conditions after the MPT. And there were the later part, we have the more extreme glacial interglacial conditions. Uh, when we have analyzed this 1423 sites, actually site U1423, and we have tried to measure the IRD, the title percentage and the, these things, like to understand that what was the conditions there because it is further in the higher latitude. Uh, there were the permanent ice sheets so were there up to the 700 or 800 mil, uh, kilo years. And then it has been the increased seasonal ice we have got. So we thought of let we explore these uh, sites to understand uh, the monsoonal or station monsoon signals, as we don't have the much of the foraminifera and all these things are there. We try to explore this in terms of uh, grain size and their uh, mineralogical analysis, which suggests that, uh, that there are the significant changes is there in the grain size sorting, their symmetry, their main grain size, uh, like in the five scale. If you see here that between when the permanent ice sheet was there, there was not much fluctuation in the main size, but after the MPT, it is started decreasing or more of the uh, finer materials we are getting. The grains are almost moderately sorted prior to date, but after this MPT, we have uh, the grains are very poorly sorted, and most of the grains are very poorly sorted. And this suggesting that there was a change in the sedimentation pattern in this region. Uh, if you also like try to get this, uh, McCoy have suggested like you can measure the bottom water current using the sortable seals. So we thought of, okay, let's see that how it varies. So if you see this, the sortable seed percent also have been increased after the middle Pleistocene transition and mean sortable site has been decreased. That means we have the more of the finer uh, particles has been coming in uh, seed side particles are coming to that site. Uh, they are 
poorly sorted and their uh, numbers or their percentage have been increased during this time period. And when we match this, try to understand this data with the Chinese lowest deposit, uh, I'll come to this, like if you're talking about the East uh, it's a winter monsoon, it carries lots of fine dust or the, from here. So there was the clean and settle paper in there, which has been measured the quartz mean grain size, and they talked about the strength of the East Asian winter monsoon. So we have used this quartz record actually to understand these changes, and we found that it was quite well matching. We have also tried to understand or make this uh, in terms of the variability with energy conditions by doing the end member modeling and all this stuff. So who suggests that it was almost stable, very low conditions up to the MPT. And after that, there were the frequent changes. And there's also the increase in the sand size percentage, decrease in the clay percentage, and it's quite well matching with the Quartz mean green size. So we are suggesting that on the basis of this, that East Asian monsoon, East Asian winter monsoon, basically, have been got stronger after this MPT in the Japan Sea, and which has been influenced uh, by this uh, what called the glacial interglacial cycles. To further confirm the, this, we have done this uh, semi-quantitative mineralogical analysis. We try to understand that what are the major minerals, and we found that the quartz, plagioclase, and feldspar are there. In a few subcases, we are getting the pyrite also, so it's in local anoxic or conditions. But uh, interestingly, is that plagioclase or the feldspar, which are immature sediments, they have in the increasing, started increasing, which is suggesting that more of the sediments or coarser sediments are also coming up from this nearby Japanese island, which has like having still that sediments having the feldspar in their record. So overall, that we try to, we are summarizing this, this is after the middle Pleistocene, this East Asian summer monsoon was getting, stronger and we have the uh, periodic changes in the monsoonal or uh, East, East Asian winter monsoon precipitation of the Japanese island. And basically it has having the uh, governed by the orbital cyclicity, especially by getting the 41 kilo cyclicity and the 23 kilo cyclicity. And we don't have the, any productivity cycles, which is 100 kilo years in this record. So this is this these cyclicities are also observed in that uh, Clemens et al. that quartz main green size. So we are assuming this all these factors are related, and the East Asian winter monsoon was like more active after the MPT in the North Japan. Uh, If you talk about that uh, uh, monsoonal precipitation, this is the curve from the Cherapunji, which was the, recording the highest rainfall. Now it is changed to the nearby village. It's called the Mosam Ram. And the most of this, in, this is the, for the Indian rain, monsoon rainfall. Uh, it is there in the May, June, July, August that we know and September. And this is the season with by the Batten Beck et al. And they have suggested that for the Indian monsoon, the source is from the Arabian Sea as well as Bay of Bengal, as we know that. And this is the most uh, during the ISM period, we are getting them both uh, the moisture source. But uh, if you see this in the uh, East Asian summer monsoon, or the, for the East Asian summer monsoon, this is the Clemens et al. that backtrack or split data is suggesting that. It is having the source, more monsoon so moisture source from the Northwest Pacific, as well as from the Indian Ocean and the maximum rainfall we're going getting in the June, July, August, September here also. So to understand this actually, uh, uh, and there are the uh, high chain data and the other data are there who's suggesting that there are the uh, different cycles are present within the record. 
However, like Clemens had suggested, the precision scale variability is not there. But we try to understand this moisture source and we analyze that because that if it's the West Pacific, then it is the crucial current which are bringing the most of the moisture to this region. We did the planktic foraminifera analysis in, along with the benthic foraminifera analysis and performed the QMOT uh, cluster analysis on the planktic foraminifera. One of my students, Nishan Bats, uh, he did his PhD and work on this site actually. So based on this, we have got this, uh, having the different conditions like uh, this reach in the neoglon due to TRI and Pata is indicating the cold water conditions, enhanced circum uh, changing dilute water, upwelling condition, and the Cashy indicator, crucial current indicators. we uh, thinking of where, where the more of the warm species, more reach in the global generated river in this part of the region. And on the basis of this, we are trying to reconstruct our uh, crucial current in this region. So this green line, this is the curve, is the effector for loading, which we have suggested the crucial current indicator species. Then the G river also the indicating the crucial current here. And we have compared with the SST record of the, at the East China Sea generated by the Clemens et al. And that yeah, SST record about the Western warm Pacific. We are finding that our data record suggests that Kurushito was strong during MIS 5, 7, 9, 11, and it was weak during MIS 2, 4, 6, 8. But interestingly, we found that uh, when we are comparing with this rainfall record of the, of the Sanbo cave, uh, this is the precipitation record. So it suggests that despite of the weaker Kurushito current uh, from the MIS 4 to 2, that East Asian summer monsoon, if you see it, the more having a depleted value, it was stronger. And we are suggesting that during the, this time period, actually that Indian Ocean was the one of the important moisture source or the major moisture source for the East Asian summer monsoon precipitation in this region. And basically this uh, crucial strength or the crucial current strength and the temperatures, it follows the trend of the West Pacific warm pool. So on the basis of this, we have suggested that uh, strong ESM during the MIS 9 and 11, which called the suboxic bottom water conditions, weak ESM and, but the other conditions which uh, support that suboxic bottom water conditions there, uh, during the MIS-7, the monsoon was uh, strong and we have the more of the suboxyl desuccess conditions and it continued in the MIS-6. MIS-5 and 4, we have the very strong monsoon and we have the very much like higher productivity and higher nutrient influx, causing the very desuccess condition there. However, the three to one, our data resolution was not good enough to go in detail, but overall suggesting the Eastern, strong station summer monsoon and the mixed uh, oxygenation conditions. And the various cave record also are suggesting that uh, during this Pleistocene or the late Pleistocene time period, they have are having the similar moisture source and it is also reflected in the different cave records as I suggested by the figure by the sky et al. And this is having the cyclicity or these uh, changes, having the cyclicity or, the, or uh, of that uh, orbital scale cyclicity, 23 kilo years, that are more prominent in these regions. Uh, when we are going to the uh, uh, precipitation record that uh, or the cave record, we have the uh, longest cave record by the from the B2 cave, which is in the northwestern Himalaya, and which is this is also the quite well matching with the Chinese record. So they have having that during the last 400 kilo years, we can suggest that, um, that say having the similar monsoon source and which is also getting reflected in the also the other cave records, uh, which are from the India and the China cave record. And most of during, especially during the uh, major global events like Hendrick event or the uh, Longa Dryas and Bolirang, right, they have having the similar behaviors. 
Uh, after the last, uh, so I'm getting to the another part after this uh, late Pleistocene, now we're talking about this uh, Holocene period or the younger intervals, uh, the monsoon. And this monsoon actually pattern, if you are analyzing in the, after the last glacial maxima, uh, we'll find that it has been more been found influenced by the solar cycles. Because if you are taking this, uh, long records, actually the resolution is not high enough to get uh, the solar cyclicity, but that uh, if we're talking about this late Pleistocene or the Holocene, we have the very good uh, or the very high resolution records are there, which can actually uh, talk about this uh, influence of the solar cycles on the monsoonal precipitations. And this, having the suggesting the, this is the period during the boiling aleroid, uh, we have found that the monsoon was strong and it is having the cycles of 208 kilo years switch cycles which is influenced. Uh, even that uh, Arabian Sea, the 723 sites, the benthic record in terms of oxic species, the toxic species were compared. And we are finding this, they are also like very much well correlated with the Northern Atlantic events or this uh, there. And it is also having like influenced by the solar cycles and the 50 to or 60 kilo, uh, 60 year cycles, which was recorded even in the instrumental records. And these are the major factors which influence the monsoon during the late Pleistocene and the Holocene time period. So basically, there is also this study we have suggested there's a change in the bottom water conditions. This called the most of the disoxic or more of disoxic species here, not only with the associated with the monsoonal or monsoonal related upwelling. Uh, so uh, we have recently tried to understand that how the different proxies behave during the wet period as well as dry period. And the one of the events like which give us the high resolution record and the number of reports are available uh, during the boiling aleroid, younger dryads, and after that, actually. So we have generated this uh, record from the Umsilin Dage Cave. We have taken the Mamlu Cave. Uh, this is indicating the Indian summer monsoon. This Kalakot Cave, which is there in the uh, northwestern part of the India in the Jammu and Kashmir states, actually, and it is indicating that winter monsoon. Uh, we have also compared with this uh, Chinese record of Olu Cave and Dong Dongi Cave, uh, that we have Soffler Caves, and then SST records or the monsoonal record from the 723, uh, the Sarasot Etal record from the Arabian Sea and Ponmai Atal record from the Western Bay of Bengal. And there's also that important that many of the previous uh, speakers also highlighted the role of the ITCJ or the, which has actually like say the rain band and where it is and how it is positioning to understand that. So if you see this uh, record from the Umsilin Dej cave, it is suggesting that monsoon was high and strong during that prior to the younger dryas, uh, rate of sedimentation of the speleotherms are normal, not that much high, but it is rate of sedimentation as well as this uh, signature that whatever we are getting here, that isotope before become the heavier. So it is having the lower monsoon we are getting during the younger dryas period. And after the end of the younger dryas of 11.3, again, they find that the rate of sedimentation or rate of increase of this or rate of formation of this will increase and we have the more higher resolution report for this part. So we have interlinearly interpolated all these records at the uh, 10 uh, years resolutions and we try to understand this basically. So statistically how it's suggesting. So this is the record from the younger dryas to the younger event. And there are different records which are suggesting that monsoon was weak 
during the younger dias, except for this uh, uh, Calacut cave here and certain SST records of the or here in the uh, what called it Western uh, yeah and certain Western Bay of Bengal record actually it is not matching otherwise so and the other cave record also. Uh, like Sofler Cave, it is not suggesting that any weaker monsoon because it was the northeast monsoon was influenced. But Palawan Cave also suggesting that the monsoon was not that weak here. And Langlar Cove also suggesting like the, the higher monsoonal precipitations during this time period. So all these different records, we try to understand and correlate these things. So what we found that during the younger dias periods, like 12.4 to 11.3 kilo years, uh, we have the all this Eastern Arabian Sea, Palawan Cave, Langlois Cave, and Western Pacific data having the similar affinities. However, this Indian and Chinese cave records, they are seeing the similarities and this Western Bay of Bengal that where we have getting the higher SST during the younger diet and softer cave, which are indicating that winter westerly current having similar affinities. So this is during the dry conditions, we are finding that, okay, they are not having the well match with the SST records or the sea surface temperature record over the oceans. None of the cave records and all these cave reports are suggesting or showing the opposite trend of the SST record over the Eastern Arabian Sea or the Western Pacific. But when we are doing the same analysis for the period during the, when the precipitation was very high, we'll find that like this, all these cave records, as well as this Eastern Arabian Sea and Western Bay of Bengal record are almost having the similar affinity or they are connected. So that means this both the different proxy may not be the behave similarly during the dry period as well as the wet period. And they have having the different behaviors in the, for the indicating that and it's depend on that how much sensitive it is to the particular changes. So we have uh, recently uh, have published the one chapter where we have correlated does uh, all these oceanic records, precipitation record or the cave records and these lake records uh, from the different parts of the uh, region, which is influenced by the Indian summer monsoon. And we have found that overall, they are suggesting the similarities, but there is the local effect, local influence are there, but the regional disparities are there in the systems. So with this, I'm going to uh, end at one more record that we have one of my students recently generated, actually we have to publish, but to understand the specifications of the Mahanadi basins, the specific the basin was during the Meghalayan time period. And especially because I'm based in the Odisha, and this is to one of our attempt to understand that how the monsoon we have and the place where I am. So this is the one of the data suggesting that uh, there are the Odisha, this state is particularly affected by the natural disasters, 93 years out of 105 years of these 50 years by flood, 32 years by drought and 11 years of cyclone. And there are the spatial and temporal variations are there in the rainfall distributions. So mainly associated with the heavy. So there's the cyclones and other ev events also, the local factors are influenced in these regions. So what we did actually to understand this, we found that we have the one of the good sites we thought that it is the Chilka Lake, which is the world's second largest blackish water lake. And when we try to understand, then we have to think of the runoff proxies. So these lakes are separated by the this sandy barrier. So there was the sandy barrier around this, and there was the sea mouth through which the seawater are intruding. All the fresh water of the river Mahanadi or Mahanadi basins are coming from the this uh, northwestern part here in these regions, and it's having like uh, seawater incursions here, 
and the fresh water here. So we did that monthly, uh, all the measurement there, and that also like that many rainfall patient data or river discharge suggests that maximum river and discharge here in this uh, June, July, or sorry, July, August, September, and October regions. It is there. So it is indicating that yes, it is get be influenced by the monsoon at this region. So we have done this. Uh, we have found out the salinity gradient. We have did the measurement of the salinity gradient, and we have done the different type of samplings there, including the seasonal box color sampling. And we have collected one core uh, from this uh, regions called as L4, which is very much influenced by the fresh water or that modern day conditions we have established there on the various proxies. So this is the core with the 150 centimeter cores. Uh, we have subsample at every centimeters and we have date them using the uh, carbon 14 dates. And with, for the top, we have the uh, sesmium peak, which is uh, generated by the Professor Ravi Bhushan in the PRL. So based on this, we have established the age model for this course. So we have the almost four carbon-14 dates and the one sesmium peak date for the 150 centimeter core. Prior to that, we have measured this seasonal variations in the foraminiferal, ostracodes, and all these things. So we found that foraminifera cannot be work here because in the fresh water regions, we are not getting any forums. And there are the modern days, there are the three different ecology is prevailing here, freshwater ecology in the north, uh, this, this river influence regions in the center, the brackish water and the Mayan ecologies are there. So what we did actually, we have also measured the grain size, uh, their elemental concentration along this salinity gradient to establish the proxy, especially to understand the, what is the modern condition, how we are getting at this site where we have taken the core. So based on this, our uh, uh, measurement, we found that aluminum by sodium, which is high during the monsoon period, this is the black line is the Southwest monsoons. And this is the period of January, where Northeast monsoon, we don't have the enough precipit precipitation, but base flow is there and this is the, uh, dry period before the monsoon when the temperatures are very high. As I beginning of the talk, we are discussing around 45 degree trees, so higher evaporation rate. So we found that kaolinite by elite ratio and the aluminum by sodium ratios are the, can be act in the very good proxies other than the sum of the ostracod species. So we have developed the age model, which is going back to the 3,550 years before periods. And the resolutions are the 45 years between the 355 to 40 and the very high six years between the younger period. Uh, energy modeling also we did for this and we found that they are, they are the sum of the ecological changes is suggesting like up to the, this period, 2,600 uh, years prepared, but after that, the, the frequent changes we are getting in the energy conditions here. And we have also compared, like before doing the paleo analysis, we are trying to compare the instrumental cell record. And the, for India, this part, we have the 1870 onwards with instrumental record, especially for the Mahanadi Basin and the Chhattisgarh Basin from where the Mahanadi originates. So we have make, taken the 10 years means of this record and we compare our data. So we have found that. Uh, it is very well matching with the instrumental record of the low monsoon. And this is the biggest feminine in India we are talking about till 1950s. And after that, it is not making because on the upper reaches of the Mahanadi Basin, the big dam was constructed to prevent the flooding event, the Hirakud Dam. And this changed the sedimentation pattern on after the formation of the Hirakud Dam. So we have, this is the records are like, not that much well matching with this. This precipitation record also like in the younger part also it was matched with the Chhattisgarh, the Sinha et al has been published, the Jumar cave record, so it is matching with this. So based on this, we have find out uh, there are the five different phases of the monsoons and phase one is covering uh, 3530 to 23 billion years, meaning one period during which 
uh, the precipitation was high or it was increasing. And then it's, uh, it is related with the end of the Vedic period. And then the Roman I period, and it was strong, then it started decreasing by the end of the Roman War period. And uh, it was low during the Dark Age cold period. Medieval, the, Myers, the medieval climatic anomaly, it was strong, but it started decreasing during this period. And the, during the LIA, the monsoon was weak. And then it is having the modern condition I have shown. So this also suggested like the changes with the kingdom here, like invasion of Ashoka and all these things it's related with, and this is the idea. Uh, we have also found like certain uh, very frequent changes for the storm, uh, small time period. We have expecting this may be the, some of the evidence of the paleo tsunami because it is suggesting all of the sudden increase of the marine ostracode species, change in the energy condition, decrease in the silt content, increase in the sand, increase in the, all of a sudden the higher amount of foraminifera diversity. So this is also associated with uh, like uh, suggesting like other tsunami indicators of ostracode it's matching well with this. And this part actually like Andaman see that um, Already, people have reported uh, that, especially the Mali cattle, that uh, tsunami reports are there. So we thought that we have the small signals of that during this time period. So overall, when we some try to summarize, there were the evidence of upwelling is there from the 12 million years onwards, and it may may or may not be associated with the AMOC, but since Pleistocene. Uh, it is there and the seasonality is there and it is associated with northern the glaciations. Uh, it is influenced by the orbital scale availability. East Asian monsoon winter become of, be stronger after the period Pleistocene transition. We can, and that Japan see site species I don't report suggesting that the frequent changes there. Uh, after during the MIS 4 to 2, that uh, Indian Ocean was a major moisture source for the East Asian summer monsoon, and the different proxies have the different response during the wet and the dry season. So we have to look carefully to that. And the solar cycles are the like most of the studies suggest had the major variability, uh, other than the local factor as well as the regional factor influencing the monsoon after the LGM. And this Mahanadi basins also it is influenced by the solar as well as the local factor like cyclone formation and all these things. So I like to acknowledge uh, Professor Anil Gupta with my supervisor and I have a team, then my PhD students who have generated all this record I have shown, and and Wolf Boom I have learned a lot from them, then the others my collaborators and the uh, students seaboard technician and colleagues of the Expedition 346 and Expedition 383, my colleagues at SOCS and my funding agency at IIT Bhumneshwar, uh, I'm Ministry of Earth Sciences, uh, NCPR and ACRP DST. So these are the beautiful pictures of the forums, which are the major proxy I have suggested on you and some field photographs, thank you. So any query, then we can go ahead. Great, thank you so much. Um, we'll let everybody uh, um, type your questions into the chat. Uh, if you have a question or you're free to raise your hand as well and we can call on you to ask a question. Um, so I'll give you a moment to put those together. Oh, I see a hand uh, being raised by Peter Clift. Would you like to ask your question out loud, Peter? Sure. Um, so. I didn't really understand why you thought the moisture in the Sea of Japan is coming, at least at some point, is coming from the Indian Ocean. It seems like a very long way to go. Why you, why you just can't get your moisture from the West Pacific Warm Pool or the South China Sea? Actually, like uh, that, it is in the East China Sea, actually, where we have found that uh, the major moisture source is coming along with the crucial current or from the West Pacific. Right. But 
the Kurushia was weak during that time also, this precipitation record suggests that they have the stronger monsoon in spite of Kurushia was weak. And it's the period during that, uh, it was that Indian monsoon we are suggesting as the major source of the moisture for that part actually. Okay, right, all right. Because SST also, it was low during that time period in the West Pacific warm pool. Okay, but the, I guess there's a difference, though, between transport in the ocean and transport in the atmosphere, isn't there? I guess yeah. I was, I mean, I could see that the warm water is clearly coming from the Kurushiro. Yes. But I wondered if the moisture, you know, the, in the air, it seemed, you know, getting a cloud from the Bay of Bengal to... You know, Fukuoka seems like a big, a big job. Yeah, but during that, this uh, southern China portion, the many of the cave record also they have suggesting this that uh, signature of the, and also this ah. split take record of the from the East uh, China Sea that Clemens also suggested that the moistures are coming from the Indian Oceans. Okay, I South China, I don't have any problems with at all. Just seems like Japan so. It is. It is. It is, it is reaching up to the East China Sea also. And yeah. Well, so, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I see that there's another question from Anne. Would you like to ask your question, Anne? Thank you, Raj. Thank you very much for this major overview. Um, I'm very interested in your record from fourteen. 23 from the Japan Sea, your yeah. rain size record. I was just wondering, um, how do you estimate any sea level influence on your record? I noticed that you had a major change, um, not really during the MPT, but a little bit later when yeah. the glacial cycles are getting very intensified. And I was just wondering how you think at that site, sea level may be influential. Uh, frankly, and I have, we have not thought of detail in that because recently that the student have been like doing the master dissertation and generated the data. So I found that these are the report, but still like for, that's why like preparing the manuscript, we have to think of all these things, but Yes, we have done this uh, before that. We have published one uh, chap book chapter uh, from the 1423, where we have taken care of the changes in the sea level using the planktic foraminifera records, which are very sparse, not continuous, and uh, like uh, and the IRD records actually, which are indicating that uh, presence of the ice sheets on that region. But yeah, overall, I have to look for all this changes in the pattern because it is after the NPT around 600 million years, uh, 600 kilo years, I'm getting the changes. So I have to look for it. Thank yeah. you for the like, patience. It's a very interesting record anyways. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Do we have any more questions from the audience? Uh, again, you can raise your hand or you can type into the chat if you like. Um, in the meantime, I have a very small question. Um, it's mostly just curiosity sake. So it's actually dealing with your the last record that you're talking about from the, the fresh brackish. Yes. And you, you mentioned that it's over in the most recent past, it's becoming more brackish. And I think you interpret it as less freshwater, um, essentially fluvial discharge. Do you think that maybe it's exacerbated by relative sea level rise in it? addition to decreased uh, runoff because it's so close to sea level. Yeah, yeah, that, that's what the, actually the problem before interpreting our uh, core record actually. And that's why we did the monthly monitoring actually or mm -hmm. the monitoring on the, yeah, so based on the modern observations that especially like elemental ratios, clay mineral compositions, that what is there in the different during the rainy period, non-rainy period, so what the uh, different, uh, Yes, we have monitored that, and our interpretations are based on that, actually, most of our interpretations. So we cannot, that's why I say I cannot use here the foraminifera or the simply the Ostracoda proxies to talk about because there may be the small seawater intuition, we can get the brackish water conditions there. So it may not work in that region. 
yeah, it's it's a lovely case study and it's so close to your institute and yeah. it's great for students. Yeah. So I, I appreciated you showing that record anyway. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I do, I do see that we have another hand up. Um, we have uh, a question from uh, Wolfgang. Wolfgang. Uh, would you like to ask your question? Wolfgang, are you there? I'm not sure if he can hear. Yeah, I was muted. So, sorry. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I, I, also, I forgot forgot about that. Yeah. yeah. I also was very impressed by the Chilica Lake uh, uh, records and, and the studies you are doing that. And I was asking, are you trying actually to, to trace element uh, geochemistry in these foreign tests to... Um, uh, to to analyze uh, salinity changes, doing combination of magnesium, calcium, and oxygen isotopes. Is that on and your list of plans for that? Yeah, we have planned for that, but not yet started. Actually, we have to still have to establish our magnesium calcium lab. Actually, it is in the process, so we have it in the in the plan. And one of the students he joined recently, so I hope that she will do that. Actually, oops, no, I, I have no. Yeah, thank you for the suggestions. Uh... Why did you switch it off? Yeah, now I don't hear anything. Uh, are, are you, are you... Uh, can you hear us now? Yes, now I can hear. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, um... so, so I was telling that uh, we have not yet started doing the magnesium calcium in the forum test. But it is there in our plan actually, and one of our one of the students recently joined. So I hope that she will do that, the part of her PhD work and all these things. So, but not yet started. Thank you for suggestions. Actually, it, it will be very helpful. That that will be very exciting. I'm looking yeah. forward to that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Do we have any last burning questions for our speaker for today? I'll see. You. Well, I think that's it. I think we've asked enough questions uh, for Dr. Singh for uh, basically this, this morning or this afternoon or evening, depending where, where you're located. So um, I think that we should all put our hands together again uh, for our speaker for today, and especially for giving us such a nice review of a lot of the monsoon proxies and records that are available. Um, and basically this, this is it and for the mid-year break. Um, so uh, please stay tuned um, either through our email list. And if you're not part of our email list, uh, you can email either myself, you can email Peter Clift or Livy Joson, who are the other hosts for this seminar series. And we'll be back, I believe in mid-August, I think is our first speaker uh, for after the mid-year break. Peter, is that correct? Um, yes, I, it's on the web. Oh, it isn't on the website actually, but it's it not will, yet on the website. It will be. And if you, <laughs> if you haven't spoken and you would like to speak, just send us an email and we'll sort something out. We're already scheduling people through to the spring of next year. Yes. So there's, and plenty, there's plenty coming up. Yes. And we particularly welcome contributions from uh, essentially finishing PhD students and postdocs. We really like to get a few more early career researchers um, in here, um, I think, as well. So, mm -hmm. uh, so that, that's it. I hope uh, all of you take care um, and you have a good break um, if you're taking a break. Otherwise, keep up the good work. We love monsoons here. Um, and uh, yeah, so thank you again. Uh, Dr. Singh for your lovely talk and thank you, thank uh, you very much we'll see you again later in the year bye, -bye. thank you <laughs> all right bye everybody bye. have a good monsoon <laughs>